Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all our distinguished guests and to all our speakers, first of all, and to all other guests that uh, uh, who are here today. Welcome to the Italian Embassy for our high-level discussion on Afghanistan's education crisis, ensuring access to education for women and girls. The program will start momentarily. We invite uh, uh, everybody to take their seat. The official program begins. I would like to kindly invite our hosts, Her Excellency the Ambassador of Italy to the United States, Ambassador Mariangela Zappia, for her introductory remarks. Madam Ambassador. Thank you, Carmelo, and good afternoon. Benvenuti a tutti quanti. Welcome to the Embassy of Italy for this timely and I'm sure a consequential conversation uh, on Afghanistan's education crisis. Um, our goal today is to spotlight the dire conditions of Afghan women and to keep their fundamental rights high in the international agenda, despite the other emergencies and challenges we are confronted with. This is and continue to be a priority for my country, for Italy. And today we are doing this together with two of the more active and effective institutions in supporting Afghan women at the global level. The Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security and Women in International Security Italy. Let me welcome and express my deepest gratitude, first of all, to Ambassador Milan Verver, a model of engagement who tirelessly support women's aspiration to fully participate as leaders in the civic and economic life of our societies and not only in Afghanistan. Melan, I really want to thank you for what you do. Many thanks to Dr. Loredana Todorescu and to Wises Italy, a great partner in this and other initiatives. Um, the United States has been exercising an exemplary leadership on such a thorny issue, striving to assist and support the civil society and the petitions of Afghan women and girls. And such effort is witnessed today by the special representative for Afghanistan, Tom West, and the special envoy for Afghan women, girls and human rights, Rina Amiri. The presence here today among us of Congresswoman I don't know if she's there, Sheila Jackson Lee, I don't see her, maybe she will arrive later, um, and her colleague Nikema Williams, alongside representatives of Speaker Emerita Pelosi, is a testament to the friendship of the American people towards Afghanistan. The United Nations is always at the forefront, and so it is today with the presence of Richard Bennett, Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Afghanistan, whom I sincerely thank. And finally, I wish to thank the Special Envoy for Afghanistan of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of Italy, who's with us today. The goal of today's event at the heart of our Women's History Month engagement is to shed light on the role of women as drivers of change for peace, security, and prosperity. This is especially important in a challenging context like Afghanistan, in which traditional and conservative dynamics are dominated by gender disparities at the expense of women, condemning the country to instability and conflict. The Taliban have not delivered. The international community united should continue to hold them accountable to the announcements and promises of the last two years. We want to highlight in particular education. Sadly, today under the Taliban's rule, Afghanistan continues to systematically deny this fundamental right to women to the extent that girls are denied an education beyond the primary school level. Deprived of their right to education, they have been progressively excluded from participation in public life, visiting public areas, having external contacts and working. During the 20 years of international presence in Afghanistan, Italy was among the countries that spearheaded efforts to support a generation of Afghan women and girls, enabling them to full enjoy rights and freedoms to pursue their dreams. 
the dream of fully being part of their society and of freely expressing their potential and their ideas. Only if Afghan women are allowed to fully develop their skills, talents, and inclinations will there be a chance for Afghanistan itself to tackle its numerous challenges, including the dire humanitarian and economic uh, situation. Without women's participation, Afghanistan society is poorer. Afghanistan economy is weaker. Depriving Afghanistan of the contribution of women is not only wrong, it is counterproductive and self-defeating. Despite the Taliban's attempt to turn back the clock of history, we are and we must remain committed to maintaining an enhanced focus on Afghanistan and Afghan women. We will not be deterred from providing support to the aspirations and expectations of the Afghan people in line with the commitment undertaken by Italy after the fall of Kabul. Italy has remained strongly committed on the humanitarian assistance front, despite the obstacles imposed by the Taliban, including the ban on women from working in NGOs, we intend to continue with our effort to provide assistance whenever possible and where the beneficiaries and especially women can be reached. Our national plan for the Afghan people is fully in line with this objective. The entire international community has learned from the lessons of the past and mobilized. Countries with a Muslim majority and their organizations, starting with the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, have raised their voice loud and clear in favor of education for Afghan girls, denying the misrepresentation that the restrictions on women's education find their roots in the tenets of Islam. This mobilization is a reason for hope. International pressure remains strong and shall increase in demanding that Afghan girls return to school. And it is crucial to hear the Afghan women themselves from the vibrant voices of the Afghan leaders who are here with us today, what they ask for and what their expectations from the international community are. We will not give in into frustration. We cannot, we must not, and we will not forget Afghanistan. And I thank you very much for you know, listening to me. And now, uh, before starting with our panel discussion, let me leave the floor to a uh, special envoy for Afghan women, girls, and human rights, Rina Amiri. Rina, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ambassador Zava. Good afternoon. Uh, and I also want to begin actually by thanking Ambassador Verveer for her leadership for decades and being for such a staunch supporter of Afghan women. Uh, and I also want to thank all of you for being here uh, for this very important discussion. Uh, March 23rd was a, another devastating day for Afghan women and girls, uh, because once again, there was this element of hope that was dashed and continues to be dashed. The crisis that we're talking about, the crisis on education is entirely man-made and specifically driven by Taliban ideology and politics. It is not justified by religion or Afghan culture as Taliban leaders claim as they continue to renege on their commitments to the Afghan people and to the international community. The world has witnessed Afghans throughout the country, including women and men, religious and tribal authorities and families courageously standing up for the rights of their daughters to be educated and of their wives to work and put food on the table. They've also called out Taliban double standards for saying that girls inside the country shouldn't be educated while they send their own daughters to school outside the country. Muslim majority leaders, as Ambassador Zappa has noted, has repudiated the bans as un-Islamic. The OAC Secretary General noted that such policies are in violation of Islamic law. And the leaders of countries such as Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Pakistan, Qatar, and the UAE, among others, have strongly rejected the Taliban's policies against women and girls and called for a reversal of these bans. Afghans understand the value of education. It is not a luxury. It's a lifeline. When I served in the UN, 
and visited villages throughout the country, one of the main appeals I heard from uh, elders and local authorities is that they wanted us to build schools for their daughter, daughters and sons. Education is a currency of hope for a better future where their families, their communities could better feed their families and improve their lives. It was a possibility, a lens into a better future. And despite the tremendous adversity faced by Afghans throughout the last 18 months, Afghans still hold on to hope. Hope that the Taliban may live up to their promise and allow the daughters of Afghanistan to go back to school and the women of Afghanistan to go back to work. But that hope is rapidly fading and exacerbating the brain drain and migration out of the country. I talk to doctors and teachers and educated Afghans who are devastated because they confront a very difficult issue, which is, do they stay and fight for their country? But in doing so, do they um, squander the future of their daughters? And many of them are making the difficult decision to leave. But I also speak to Afghans, particularly women and girls who are determined to fight for their education, their future, and the future of Afghanistan. They remind us what is at stake. Afghanistan is a young country. Nearly 64% of its population is under 25. The Taliban policy of banning girls from receiving an education is already leading to forced marriage, underage marriage, and is going to lead to greater maternal mort mortality, economic decline, extreme poverty, and a generation that is going to be deprived of so much. They also warn that the changes in curricula for boys is going to pose a threat to Afghanistan's long-term stability and regional and international counterterrorism concerns. Just as the last 20 years of investment produced dramatic results, the Taliban's extreme policies are likely to engender consequential outcomes that will extend far beyond Afghanistan's borders. Afghan women and girls are not only leading the struggle for their education, they are once again valiantly fighting for what we all seek, a stable and moderate Afghanistan that is at peace with itself and its neighbors. What they ask of us is solidarity, political will, and a preparedness to match our rhetoric with concrete efforts funding and support. We will continue to use all the tools at our disposal to push the Taliban to reverse these destructive decrees. We are also committed to identifying how we can work with Afghans, particularly women and girls, to come up with creative solutions to identify how we can support education and work initiatives in the immediate term and real time. To that end, in September, with, the Secretary, uh, with Secretary Blinken, we launched the Alliance for Afghan Women's Economic Resilience, a public-private partnership that aims to advance Afghan women's ent entrepreneurship, workforce participation, and educational opportunities in Afghanistan and in third, uh, third countries. Since then, the Alliance has been busy undertaking initiatives that are informed by Afghan women through consultations and a mobile-based survey we're conducting of 6,000 women inside Afghanistan and 6,000 women who have been forced into exile and are living scattered all over the world. We've been told by Afghan educators that they experience four key gaps, internet connectivity, electricity devices such as laptops and tablets, and mental health support. The Alliance is seeking to build out a virtual education initiative with private sector, uh, uh, the private sector, philanthropic institutions, academia, and civil society partners to focus on filling those gaps so that Afghan women and girls can continue learning and by doing so, help build a more resilient, safe, and equitable Afghanistan. We welcome partners to join the Alliance and help achieve this goal. I've also been working with Muslim majority countries to encourage their efforts to support in support of Afghan women and girls to both counter Taliban claims that their regressive decrees are based on Sharia, but also to, uh, to solicit concrete support 
And there are many countries that are taking leadership roles in this regard. And I'm really happy that they say, let us lead, because we didn't hear that in the 1990s, and now we're hearing that. And December, Indonesia and Qatar, for example, co-chaired uh, the International a Conference on Afghan Women's Education, bringing together 40 countries, a third of them representing Muslim majority countries, to solicit support for the education of women and girls. They secured 500 scholarships for Afghan girls, and they are committed to continuing this effort and have several plans underway to continue this work in Qatar and in many other Muslim majority countries. Bangladesh, the UAE, and many other countries are also expressing a strong interest to be a part of this work. In closing, our commitment will have to be for the long term. This is going to be a long fight for Afghan women, and we must step right behind them with our support. We must keep hope alive and match the resilience of Afghan women and girls with the same steadiness, resolve, and determination. Thank you. Thank you, Rina. And once again, I'm really very happy to welcome uh, Ambassador Melan Vera, a dear friend, the co-host of this event, and an incredible advocate for women's rights. Melan, you're at the floor. Well, thank you so much, Ambassador Zahia. And thank you for your steadfast leadership for your bringing us together here on Italian ground in Washington to address Afghanistan's education crisis for women and girls. It is also about the future of Afghanistan. We at the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security have been so pleased to be able to partner with the great Italian ambassador here and with the international security uh, women in International Security Italy, uh, to bring together Afghan experts whom you will meet, Ital international partners, diplomats, leading policymakers, all of whom will reflect this afternoon on the urgency of this situation and how to pave a path forward for the future of education for Afghan women and girls. And thank you too to Rena for your unstinting efforts on behalf of women and girls in Afghanistan. Rena and I were colleagues in the State Department several years ago, and I know firsthand just how dedicated she is to this cause. Let me also welcome all who have gathered here to focus on this most critical issue. Especially, I want to acknowledge our Afghan friends you continue to inspire us with your tenacity and commitment to human rights. As the Taliban methodically work to erase 20 years of gains, proclaiming draconian edict after edict and work to strip Afghan women and girls of their human rights, it is fitting that we come together to support them. Their situation holds grave consequences for each of them, of course, but also for the future of their country and for regional and global security. This past week, the Taliban government reopened schools for the new school year, but the classroom doors remain shut to Afghan adolescent girls and to women. Afghanistan is the only country in the world where women and girls are deprived of an education because of their gender. Even Islamist governments, as you heard, whether Iran or Saudi Arabia, have condemned the Taliban's actions. Yesterday in Kabul, the Taliban arrested four women courageously taking part in a protest against the ban on education. They chanted slogans like, educated mother, powerful country. You took my land, don't take my lessons. We meet today in solidarity with them and so many more. I don't know how many of you saw 
yesterday's special New York Times supplement on the plight of Afghan women and girls. The pictures of their grief and loss are haunting, and so are their words. <clears throat> 20-year-old Fatima said, the day the Taliban shut the schools, it felt like I fell from a roof. I hit the ground. I felt crushed and I died from inside. Miriam, 17, said, the future is dark. I feel like a bird that has wings but can't fly. And Parissa, 19-year-old former university student said, those of us in grade 12 are standing above a ditch. You don't know if you should jump over it or throw yourself into it. We can only imagine as we sit here, what it's like to have one's aspirations dashed and rights to an education taken away. The article ends with the story of a secret school in Kandahar for high school students for whom it is an oasis and an act of defiance. Every precaution is taken so they are not detected. The brave teacher at the end says, regimes can come and go in Afghanistan, but we should study and be ready for whatever comes next. This is the backdrop of today's discussion. We all agree that there is no single solution for this crisis. No can there be a replacement for formal school and the right to an education. So while we will discuss possible alternatives to the current situation, we all recognize there is no replacement for formal schooling. The Afghan women leaders who are with us today continue to advocate tirelessly for the full realization of Afghan women's rights and to innovate avenues to pursue the right to an education, even under the current circumstances. With that, let us discuss what we can do to ensure access to education for women and girls in the short term with the school doors closed to them, and at the same time to strengthen our advocacy for the restoration of formal education. We now turn to our first panel, Reflections on the Education Crisis, Critical Areas of Concern, Navigating Barriers and Innovative Models of Education. I'm gonna invite our panelists to come up to the stage, please. We have... Palwasha <clears throat> Hassan, the former director of the Afghan Women's Educational Center and senior fellow at the Georgetown Institute of Women, Peace and Security. She is to my far right. Sarah Wahidi, the founder and CEO of, of Etisab, an Afghan-based startup developing civic technology solutions to improve safety by providing access to verified real-time information about security situations. She is in the middle. And Joe Bourne, the Chief Technical Officer at the Global Partnership for Education, a fund bringing investors together to finance and strengthen equitable global education systems. So welcome to each and every one of you. Thank you. Palwash, I'm going to start with you. You've been a longtime practitioner in this area, uh, both women, uh, women's rights leaders in the civil society sphere, uh, and someone who has been a real leader in education uh, through all your years in Afghanistan. You're in very close touch, although you're in exile, you're in very close touch with many in Afghanistan today. Tell us what you're hearing about this most critical area of concern, uh, education crisis, and what 
do you think is possible in the current circumstances? What would be useful interventions? Sure. This is on, right? Just press. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Ambassador Zapia for a very timely event um, uh, on education crisis in Afghanistan. And thank you, Ambassador Verveer, for your uh, continuous support of Afghan women and their voices. Um, I, I think I cannot say more than what already uh, Special Envoy Amiri said, uh, that not letting girls and women to education is beyond any words. It is shattering every hopes that women can uh, inspire. Uh, it is uh, shattering uh, all the inspiration that they can have for the future. And that is what Afghan women are living with uh, in today's Afghanistan. Um, this is the second year uh, that uh, there were hopes that school will restart uh, for our younger uh, uh, girls. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the uh, school doors are closed close for girls. And I think that explain everything um, what women of Afghanistan are suffering under. Any uh, demonstration or um, uh, voice which is raised in Afghanistan is also met with brutality uh, and women are arrested just like yesterday uh, uh, demonstration uh, in Kabul. Uh, when we are talking with women, uh, they are complaining about psychological uh, stress that uh, younger girls having in their homes. So it's not only about their future, it's also about uh, what are they dealing because there is nothing that they can uh, attach themselves with. Um, at current level, uh, there is no national advocacy, for instance, because women NGOs, as you know, are also not allowed to perform. Um, so there is no meaningful forum for Afghan women inside Afghanistan that they should not be met with uh, that kind of opposition by Taliban and there be an engagement for them to start discussion why we are not allowed uh, for what we deserve under Islam, Sharia, and international human rights, very basic rights that any woman or girl in the world should have it and they don't have it. So this is the situation that there are very little possibility for women to speak their words and uh, to engage with authority and ask for what they deserve uh, to have. Having said that, uh, it's also important to acknowledge what is happening outside uh, Afghanistan and inside Afghanistan for all those efforts, which is uh, at this time going on, whether it is uh, online education or there is homeschooling, different models. I think all these local uh, solution which uh, women has come up with, uh, like the first round of Taliban, uh, I think the underground schools which was started by women has no example anywhere in the world. And right now, of course, there are the differences, like not the Taliban attitude is different, but I think the woman capacity is much different than before. We have 18% of the people have access to internet. And I think that is making it possible with use of technology and online education, for instance. And uh, there is also uh, different uh, models of education, like community-based education, uh, homeschooling, uh, uh, use of uh, media, and different ways that these efforts which is going on, these are important to be supported in a more efficient way. I think for any uh, initiative which can demonstrate uh, gauging the progress that a woman can learn or a girl can learn more, that is important to be supported at this point. But that doesn't mean uh, that they, this, these efforts can replace what Afghan women deserve or, or have the right to. And that is the education uh, that they need, that the schools need to be open. There is a bigger frustration and also disappointment of Afghan women uh, versus international community for not doing enough to force Taliban to reopen what they should do. I know this is a difficult question and many in this room, I know personally they are doing whatever they uh, can 
to push uh, uh, the limits uh, so that Taliban can change their position in Afghanistan. But I think we need more and more uh, support for Afghan women. And, uh, but that doesn't mean uh, that we are asking for stopping all the support which is going to Afghanistan, especially, especially on humanitarian needs. 97% uh, of our population are living under a poverty line. And that is huge for any country. So any suffering um, uh, uh, for um, uh, inside the country will be direct uh, push also to all those people who are living in that country and kind of like hijacked by Taliban in the, under that circumstances. So it's important to carefully choose initiatives and ways to support and maneuver whatever, or maybe uh, not even maneuvering is the, uh, the way that Afghan women themselves chooses. For instance, I have this example of a Hirati woman. Uh, they, um, uh, they choose um, uh, homeschooling uh, for all this time when Taliban stopped them from uh, going to school. And they went for exam through one of the private school. They negotiated with Taliban, local Taliban in their own city to make this possible for them uh, to be aggregated or recognized for their one year education in their home. Also like some women in Logar, they started uh, their school uh, lessons in a madrasa, in a religious school. So they have different solution which design according to their own possibility. And I think this is important to take all these initiatives and what they have designed to be supported. Thank you so much, Palasha. Um, Sarah, Palasha talked about um, the internet, other kinds of virtual learning. Um, you, through Etesab, has been, have been doing extraordinary work in making digital platforms available in Afghanistan. How can innovation and tech uh, respond to the current situation? And can you give us any uh, concrete examples of ways in which that is currently happening? Thank you so much, Ambassador, uh, for having me here, Your Honorable Ambassador and Ambassador Verveer. It's an honor to be here alongside my panelists. Um, well, first of all, uh, for me, I, I think following the Taliban collapse, the, the Taliban takeover in August 2021, I had to make the decision of, of letting go um, all of my female staff at Ehtisab. And that was primarily because I couldn't uh, promise that they would be safe. Before we had an office in downtown Kabul um, in, in a place called Netlinks Plaza, and uh, we had to shut that down. Uh, in that year that we had no female staff, um, our work definitely was impacted in the terms of the way that we were able to speak to our female users. There weren't those nuances that women know about how to communicate with their fellow women, especially Afghan women. And fo following uh, last year, I made the decision that slowly I wanted to integrate women back into my team. And since then, the way that we uh, collate reports, the way that we verify reports, the way that we send out messaging through our alert system to our users has that female nuance, that Afghan women nuance of, of what information is pertinent and how do you uh, vocalize that information. So definitely having local female women stakeholders in, in every context, especially when it comes to um, uh, technological interventions is incredibly important. And also that they are uh, local, locally driven. And and especially in the context of what, what Madam Hassan had just said, um, technology doesn't have to be an overarching uh, solution in terms of everyone needs to have a smartphone, everyone needs to have a tablet. It can really be centralized. For example, in uh, post-COVID in the DRC, uh, there was a system called the IAI, which is interaction, Interactive Audio uh, Platforms, where a radio uh, a station was able to... Um, provide the grade six and grade seven curriculum in the DRC with an updated curriculum led by teachers who had smartphones, who had tablets, but then the students would be listening to the content through radio. And then uh, every week after classes, um, pages of homework would be provided. So there was a, a mix of offline and online content. And I think the concern is how do you get a smartphone in every Avon's hand? It doesn't have to be that way. It's definitely uh, can be a mix of both. And uh, in our context at Ehtasal, we, we also struggled with that. I built an app in 2018 because the upward trajectory was that we were going to match India's by 75% a smartphone usage by 2025. 
obviously that's not going to happen anymore. Uh, so we've also had to figure out how do we move offline because to be realistic, especially in the context of electricity that you just spoke about, we're not going to get uh, smartphones um, in every Avalon's hands. That's just not going to happen. So we're just going to have to figure out how to utilize offline and online methods. Um, but I think that central component of community leaders, women leaders, um, educators being provided the tools that they can uh, then uh, provide offline methodologies to teach is a great way. Uh, there are amazing examples currently in place. Uh, we spoke together at the CSW. We had the amazing Farah Sto Hakim who spoke. Uh, she currently has an offline uh, underground school, but she also has the online university. So the way that she's able to facilitate that is that she has uh, teachers who are provided the curriculum, but they have smaller pockets of underground schools, um, but also uh, utilizing radio, utilizing videos. So Farah Sto is an amazing example of that, utilizing technology, but off obviously in the offline context. There's also uh, Farisha Faru, who wasn't able to be here today, but uh, Code to Inspire is an amazing example as well. Unfortunately, that's <clears throat> primarily, uh, you know, laptop, smartphone driven. But again, um, it's important that, especially if, if there's like a, a group of young women getting together, that there is um, a central um, instructor that's able to facilitate some of those gaps when it comes to the technology component. And also um, Pashtana Durani's uh, Learn Afghanistan, uh, who's providing um, underground schools, but also um, um, technological innovations through uh, coding and, and keeping women online. But again, all of the examples that I just gave still struggle with electricity, still struggle with um, internet. Uh, in our team, we were able to raise, I don't know, 1500, which I mean, right right now, raising money for anything that doesn't just keep up on people starving and just feeding their mouths, people aren't really willing to invest in anything more than that. And I really hope that the conversation after this speaks to the fact that uh, Avons don't just need to be fed and Avons don't just need shelter, they need long-term sustainable support. And that really comes from supporting Avons uh, who are leading innovation uh, across Afghanistan. But I think that there isn't really an interest in looking beyond the status quo and that needs to happen. Uh, and I can definitely refer many people to amazing Avons who are leading in that context. Um, but it's that, you know, anyway, we were able to raise about 1500 to get three solar panels for my team and I provided them only to my female staff so they could be online and ensure that we were able to keep the alert system on. Um, so that's just, you know, the kind of, you know, hands-on ways that we're able to mitigate our issues when it comes to electricity. But again, uh, just being able to raise such a small amount of money for sol solar panels was was difficult. But there's a lot of also solar panel innovation across the world that's happening with smaller sol solar panels that don't require so much time um, to provide power. So there's also that, but right now the solar panel industry in Afghanistan is still stuck in the early 2000s. We're not really seeing a lot of innovation there. Um, so there are ways to, to support uh, in that context. Um, and then I guess what I'll finish off with is in terms of uh, Avon women um, and the way that we are trying to support at least, you know, hearing them, their vocalization and, and things like that is, uh, we're currently building an API within the Ehtisab app, which is offline. So for example, um, we're trying to figure out areas of urban mobility issues and, and issues that Avons are dealing with, especially Avon women. So we're building an API within the app that's offline so women can have access to urgent information, but we're also able to geotag and follow what's going on. Because right now, I think our conversations are very narrative and very qualitative and the world is moving very data-driven and a lot of us aren't being taken seriously because we are speaking from a very emotional context. And I would say to a lot of Avons, especially the youth um, who are working in Afghanistan, you know, have the data to back up your ideas. It's not just going to work and, you know, we're struggling and we don't have, uh, we don't have access to education or our, our Avon sisters don't, but you need to have robust understanding of really what is your solution and what is the current uh, context. And that's really what's something we're trying to support at this hub as well in education um, uh, and, uh, interventions is that how can we have the data to back up a lot of these education platforms and how can we ensure that when we're at the table and we're speaking about this, we're not just being heard from our emotions, but also the data to prove that, you know, we have the solutions and we know what the context that we're working with. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for giving this that overview of um, technological possibilities, some of them already functioning well, but also the fact that electricity is a real barrier uh, to what can be done. Um, and maybe we can continue that with you, Joe. 
Uh, you are with the Global Partnership for Education. I know that you do work, your organization does work in many crises settings uh, with that, where access to education is a real problem. Um, can you walk us through some of the, the kinds of obstacles, but more importantly, the solutions that you found that work um, and particularly what can be applied to Afghanistan? Sure, thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you to the Government of Italy for, for hosting this discussion, and thank you to my fellow panelists and everyone else who'll come, because I think this will be a learning moment for me as much as anything else. Um, as you say, we're, we're, we're both a fund and a partnership, um, and that means, you know, who we work with, what we fund is very, is very guided by the context by the partners in country. Normally those partner, those are partner governments, but it's also civil society, private sector, private foundations, donors, uh, multilateral organizations, others. There's a lot of, you know, who is the partnership on the ground? Um, in most cases, we work with willing national governments, um, you know, which helps achieve scale and sustainability and helps us drive a dialogue on, on equity and reaching the most vulnerable. But in places like Afghanistan, but also Syria, Myanmar, to name a couple of others, we don't work directly with, with the authorities or de facto authorities, um, and we work with other partners. And a lot of how we work, and it's a kind of overarching piece, is determined by access you know, who's already there and doing the work is absolutely critical. Um, who can safely reach children? Um, you know, we've worked with Afghanistan as a country for the last couple of decades. We've been partnered in that amazing uh, progress that the country has made in education. And now we're having to change tack and change tack very, very quickly um, since the Taliban had taken over. But even before that, you know, partners were working in Taliban held areas. So there is some experience within the country, um, as well as from other countries of what's possible. I mean, lessons from our support to other countries, and, and you mentioned some of them during COVID, for example, often suggest that you need a range of, of no tech, low tech solutions, as well as putting in place the learning platforms, um, and, you know, depending on what's appropriate, but even those are never going to be enough. Um, thinking about concurrent interventions with community outreach was a big thing that we learned during COVID. Tackling issues such as teenage pregnancy, something that we learned during responses in Ebola, during Ebola, you know, domestic violent, violence tends to go on the rise, eventual dropout happens in places where children are less likely to go to school. So interventions need to actually look a little bit more at a rounded way, not just the how do we get the materials to children into children's hands. Um, other crises situations, including prolonged crises, um, accelerated learning programs, you know, with some hope that they might tag back into the formal system if possible, and that is something that Afghanistan has good experience in as well. Um, are quite useful but again it depends on very much the situation um school rehabilitation psychosocial support i mean none of this sounds particularly innovative um because te people tend to talk innovation and technology um but i think the really important piece here is 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 what is happening already and where are the local solutions and how can those local solutions be supported in order to reach reach children and reach the most marginalized children um so you know from afghanistan and i I think you've heard it. I mean, data from the ground, um, UNICEF, you know, does indicate that the ban on secondary education is not being fully endorsed in all provinces. So it's a very varied situation across the country. Um, but sort of information on the ground also indicates that the Taliban has been reactive to news on the ban being breached. So this is not an easy situation to work in. Um, partners in the country that we talk to have been cautious about taking actions at scale that directly support the attendance of girls in secondary education, um, which was essentially defying the ban. Um, and this is very much an application of the do no harm principle of international aid. Um, you know, the Taliban may prosecute those who are involved in breaching the ban, including those who receive an intervention. So we have to be very cautious that anything we do do is kind of walking that line. Um, you know, alongside others, we've continued to support community based education services that you've talked about. Um, you know, these services support boys and girls, particularly at primary, but more girls than boys. Um, we've also there's also coordinated action by partners on the ground for the delivery of textbooks to all students 
uh, registered in public schools with particular mechanisms to try to ensure that those textbooks reach girls. And other partners um, are, are exploring how to support grassroots organizations, you might call them secret organizations, um, local innovations that may be quietly reaching girls. Um, and options obviously include online and radio resources, which you've talked about, um, community-based education and having these things where they can work in tandem. There is sort of little point in having a community, an online radio program over here if it's not actually talking to the materials that you've managed to get out to people. So that ability to coordinate. Um, and I think, as you said, it's, it's really important to, in, to explore all these alternative ways and to do it quickly, which is what we've been trying to do, and to try to monitor what's happening in terms of services to girls affected by the ban. But we also want to avoid the establishment of a second class education for mm -hmm. girls, you know, not least of all, because it may actually undermine the efforts to to stand up and to advocate against the ban. It gives an excuse Well, something's happening. So, you know, we won't we, you know, we, we don't want to do anything that actually harms the ability to to advocate for, as you said, the, the formal and proper quality education for all children. Um, you know, for us, we've, you talked about money, <laughs> um, you know, we've made available up to $300 million uh, in GPE funds um, to support education for all children in Afghanistan. Obviously, that's a lot of money and not easy to work out exactly how to spend well. Um, the education partners on the ground have developed what they're calling an Afghanistan education transitional framework, so a coordinated, an attempt to coordinate the different partners who are doing different activities, um, you know, working across the humanitarian and development divide, as they often talk about. Um, and that plan sort of gives some clue as to how to best channel some of those, resor those resources, including to local solutions, community-based education, teacher training, um, wash facilities in schools as well, of course, and also monitoring programs. Um, I think, you know, I'll just end. I read an article this morning just in the news <laughs> with BBC on the app um, about three Afghani girls in their early teens just describing the abrupt end to their education, uh, their ongoing confusion. Will I go back to school or will I not go back to school? Um, their faint hope, which gets slammed, as you talked about earlier, and their deep concerns for their future. And, you know, I worried about the safety their names were changed um it is hard to see a way forward i applaud them for their bravery i applaud everybody for their bravery for continuing to speak out and i know from our point of view we want to keep walking alongside um everyone because i do worry you know how many generations of women and girls because this may be happening now to current women and girls but this is a generational thing how many generations of women and girls will this ban this, this ban rob of their education and their future. So again, you know, a huge thank you for keeping the political conversation at the top of the agenda while we do our best to try to support the amazing work of people on the ground. Well, thank you so much, Joe, and for what you and your organization do. Uh, the consequences are enormous. There's no doubt about it, uh, but thanks to each of you for helping us understand better uh, how to navigate some of the barriers. Not easy for sure, we all heard that, uh, and also to explore some alternatives, albeit temporary alternatives, and we can't say that enough. There is no replacement for formal education, but uh, these are some ways that that gap is being closed today, albeit with great difficulty and uh, in ways that are far from perfect. So let's please thank our panelists. I am now so pleased uh, to introduce the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation in, uh, of human rights in Afghanistan, Richard Bennett. He has worked extensively in the human rights space and in Afghanistan specifically. He comes well equipped uh, for the position that he finds himself in uh, today, a very difficult position. He previously served as the Chief of Human Rights Service with the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan, UNAMA, and a special rapporteur. Uh, he has recently released 
his second report to the UN Human Rights Council. And I know all of us are eager uh, to hear the insights uh, that he will provide for us uh, from that report uh, to enhance our understanding about the current situation in Afghanistan. So, uh, Mr. Bennett, please. Thank you, Ambassador Bavia, um, and uh, also the um, Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security for co-hosting this event, this important event. And I thank also Ambassador Zapia uh, and the Embassy of Italy uh, as hosts and co-hosts. It's actually quite difficult to know what value I can add to the amazingly rich discussion that we've just heard and the speeches we heard before that. I wanna start with an anecdote. Yesterday, I was just getting on the flight to fly here and my WhatsApp started going mad because Afghan women were sending me messages saying that uh, there had been violence and that four women had been uh, arrested who were protesting the fact that Afghan women and girls would not be able to attend school or university. And they wrote asking me to do something. So I wondered, well, what can I do? And I, I, I replied and said, well, when I get at the end of the flight, I'll tweet. And I did. And I explained also that today I'm speaking at this event uh, on the issue. But even in doing so, I said that it sounds like more words. And what Afghan women really need is more action. And how can we deliver action that can make a difference? I'm speaking between the panels and I feel like we're already hearing that action is being taken to take a different, make a difference. And if we're swinging between being, between despair and hope, I want us all to come down on the side of hope and hope that will eventually be fulfilled. This morning, I had the opportunity to participate with a really inspiring group, not in education space, but in the justice and health uh, space. Uh, that's managing to, cre to creatively, creatively navigate the space left in Afghanistan to deliver support to legal and health services to survivors of sexual and gender-based violence. All over the place, we see these very important initiatives that need and deserve to be supported. And one of my messages is to the donors is to keep funding these initiatives, please. And I don't particularly want to take one uh, experience uh, as an example, but I think I must mention that yesterday in the British news, Save the Children was complaining that its funding, Save the Children UK, had been cut from seven billion pounds, not billion, wish it was, seven million pounds to one million pounds. And they had gone public on that, which shows that they were taking it very seriously. So, I'm truly inspired by the, it's almost become a cliche, the bravery, the courage of Afghan women, but it's more than that. It's the ingenuity and the skills of Afghan women that is so impressive. And I hope 
that the Taliban are participating, are listening to this event today, because they must see those skills and that ingenuity. I think already what we've heard uh, is pretty consistently in, in today's messaging that um, the informal education initiatives that are ongoing are no replacement for the right to education, the right for a proper first-class education without discrimination on the grounds of gender or in fact on any other grounds. And we should remember that education is an enabling right. It's a right in itself, but it enables all the other human rights, the right to work, the right to access healthcare, the right to an adequate standard of living and many other rights. And so the education initiatives that are being used will never be sufficient. They are not alternatives and we must never normalize what is utterly unacceptable in the first place. The Taliban are on a kind of purification campaign. In their view, they're trying to create a society based on their version of Islam. It's an ideological campaign. Education is clearly one of the main tools to shape a society in the long term. That's why it's so politicized and has been in Afghanistan. Well, it, we're 100 years from the first constitution of Afghanistan in 1923. So for at least 100 years. But the Taliban version doesn't consider women and men to be equal. They know also that educating women are empowered women and may challenge their hegemony, their patriarchy. They restore, they fought an, insur an insurgency to restore their ideology. We started in the 1990s and they fought for an ideology that stands in contrast to human rights, uh, seeing them as only Western values. They won't succeed. The genie is already out of the bottle. We see this in the daily protests of women on the streets of Kabul and other cities and in their determination to be educated. But one thing that does concern me is that even if secondary schools for girls and universities do open, do reopen, and they may, what kind of education is going to be provided. And this concerns me a lot. I look at the recent trends of the establishment of new madrasas across the country for boys and girls. And the consistent statements of the Taliban about the significance of religious studies in comparison with modern education, which is, as I've said, perceived to be promoting un-Islamic or Western values, and their proposed revision of the existing curriculum. I managed to get a, a, a glimpse at uh, some headlines from that the other day, uh, and it's extremely worrying in my view. These flag efforts to promote radicalization amongst the younger generation of Afghans. Many school premises have already been used to established madrasas. 
There are also disturbing reports from boys' high schools that highlight the, the replacement of qualified professional teachers with religious teachers and with significant changes in the curricula and a limited provision of subjects. Consistent statements and directives issued by the de facto Ministry of Education on the implementation of the new rules and regulations have made these schools and its students easy victims of radical indoctrination. And I think we know where that might lead to. And it means that even if schools reopen for girls, the content of a standard education system may be seriously compromised and replaced with an extremist religious curriculum. So I guess this is my challenge uh, to this group and to others, how to deal with this extremely difficult dilemma that under Taliban rule, when schools reopen, they may be radicalized. At the same time, the alternative forms of education are never going to be sufficient and not deliver the rights of girls and women to an education and to all those other rights. And then maybe I'll wrap up because I'm, I'm looking forward and I'm sure you are to the second panel. You don't want to hear me for too long. Um, but I do also echo what Rena and Mary and others have said about what is needed now to deliver some education in a supplementary, not an alternative fashion, electricity, more equipment, mental health care, because, you know, even in the primary schools, which are open to girls, the uh, classes are dropping off because parents and the girls themselves are beginning to think, what's the point? I can't go beyond grade six. And so attendance is starting to drop according to reports that I'm, I'm seeing uh, already. So electricity, uh, 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 mental health, equipment. Uh, these have all been mentioned uh, before, uh, but I, I finally want to mention the issue of, of coordination and collaboration between the many excellent initiatives, some of which we are witnessing today and hearing about today. Um, but finally, the issue of certification, because if we're talking secondary school and leading to possibly tertiary studies and then leading to professional employment, certification that is recognized in Afghanistan and abroad is going to be crucial. And that's one area that I'm not, maybe people are discussing that, but I haven't heard that yet. So I would like to um, uh, suggest that this issue um, of, of certification um, uh, be, be added. I think I'll wrap up there. Um, I don't think there are, there's any one solution. I think there, there needs to be multiple means to move forward and the capacity to handle the paradox that I've tried to hi highlight today. And we've heard, and, and it's heartbreaking to hear how hopes are built up and then they're dashed. And I think we need to, that, that really does cause anguish and long-term mental, mental trauma. We need to be realistic with what we're dealing with, be positive that it will be overcome 
and the ingenuity and bravery will overcome it. Uh, but it will be a long road ahead. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Special Rapporteur, um, for those compelling remarks. And indeed, you have laid out the dilemma, and it is not an easy one to solve. Uh, and I think it was uh, really important for us to hear um, <clears throat> that the growth of the alternative, uh, the Taliban alternative of madrasas, is not an alternative for real education. Uh, and yet uh, more and more young people are being ensnared uh, into the madrasa alternative. Um, so much to be concerned about, and thank you for your longstanding hard work um, on this very tough issue. We're now going to move uh, to our next panel, uh, which is going to be focused on the path forward and how the international community uh, can come together to affect change. So could the panelists please come up? So we have uh, with us Ambassador Adela Raz, the Afghanistan's former permanent representative to the United States and to the Afghan mission earlier at the United Nations. Uh, she is currently the director of the Princeton University School of Public and International Affairs Afghanistan Policy Lab. And she is to my immediate left. Uh, And Dr. Uh, Habiba Sarabi, the former Minister of Women's Affairs, the former governor of Bamiyan province, uh, the former member of the negotiation team of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. I think I've known you in all those positions and you've done extraordinary work at great odds. Thank you and welcome, uh, Dr. Sarabi. And Dr. Laredana Tio. Tio do Rescue. I hope I did that right. She has flown in from Italy to be with us, and we're thrilled about that. She is with Wise Italy, the president, and also the president and head of the Mediterranean Women Mediators Network, which is so critically important in building the capacity of women to be mediators uh, in peace processes. So a big hearty welcome to you as well. So Ambassador Roz, you have uh, certainly had uh, significant efforts that you've been making, uh, had been making in the international uh, sphere, both at the United Nations and uh, certainly in the bilateral situation here in the United States. Um, please share with us your insights about what the international community could be doing now, should be doing now, um, have we tapped into the possibilities at the United Nations enough? Um, what about the Security Council? What, what in that sphere uh, of international uh, relations uh, can we be leveraging more significantly, if at all? Thank you, Ambassador Vivier, for um, this uh, great question. And thank you, Mariangela, the Embassy of Italy, for inviting me. And it's truly an honor and pleasure to be sharing the panel with great panelists and uh, hearing the rich conversation earlier, including Richard, your remarks. Um, I think it's very hard to start after Richard. He um, gave us a very realistic and uh, maybe not too bright, but um, pragmatic picture of what is happening right now. And, where the international community is at this stage. Um, there is a part of we look optimistic and there is a part of we are very realistic and be very pragmatic. If we are optimistic or if we think based on what policies are available, of course, at the Security Council, the first thing we think of is the sanctions. And it has been an instrumental uh, tool, um, has been uh, pretty effective, uh, especially before the fall of August, uh, fall of Kabul and before uh, August of uh, 2021. 
and it has been also an important tool for negotiations then and even now it can play a role. But when it comes to individuals like the Minister of Education and those people who are at the place right now who are making the very tough decisions or those who are in Kandahar and making the decisions on the education sector, a woman's ban from working, working with humanitarian aid organizations, it really, it really brings us to one uh, tough point is that how much it matters to them. Um, uh, is it still impactful or not? I think to a certain level it is, but to a certain level, we have to think more uh, creative and be very nuanced as to, to the conversation. Uh, we have to start thinking on creating greater individual pressure. I think there is one tool we haven't used yet. It's their families who live abroad and still be able to go to schools and study. Um, this is the right question we all need to raise and it comes from the Afghan community. It comes from our international partners. We have to start raising these questions with Taliban leaders whose family right now are outside of Afghanistan. Kids go to school, their daughters go to school, but while other Afghan girls in Afghanistan cannot. Mm -hmm. So I think that could be probably still the first pressure. I think the second, we have a debate on humanitarian aid. And you probably will come across uh, two groups of people who would say, well, seize the aid because it will create a pressure on Taliban, and, uh, and then you would be able to speak with them. And there's a group of us, which I'm very also part of that, when I say that probably will not create enough pressure or no pressure at all, because we, we know them. We know them from 25 years ago. I was in Afghanistan first time when they came into power. And I completely remember the dark image of when Afghanistan was in complete isolation from the rest of the world, uh, where schools were completely banned. Even uh, there was no primary education available at the time. And, uh, and we were dying out of hunger. And it did not matter to Taliban at the time. And I don't think so it matters to them even now, uh, despite how much pressure aid-wise can arrive on them because it's a regime that came to power not because people voted for them. They don't have the constituents in that sense. It's a regime that came to power because of their force. I think the, it, the debate we have, or I think the proposal we often have um, in regards to aid is send aid, but have um, benchmarks to make sure it does go in the hands of uh, women and women beneficiaries are able to get access to rather than banning the aid completely. And then I think the third element was what we uh, talked um, earlier was that we do must continue our development projects one way or the other. There is no solution around it. And I think the third is the recognition. Uh, there's still many debates. Some say, well, recognition do matter to them. And to some it says, look, recognition may not even matter to them. And certainly for those who are in Kandahar, um, it may not be a really important element of um, great pressure for negotiation, but definitely for those who are in Kabul and still have been able to travel around the region, they were in the peace sharing talk in Qatar. Uh, they, it is an important uh, tool still to discuss and it could be a pressuring point. And I think um, the, 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 the important part that we uh, often forget in conversation is the region. I think when we talk about Afghanistan and what we can do and what we can't, uh, there is a great reference that uh, Ms. Amiri, uh, especially in Boy Amiri earlier mentioned, which was the role of the Muslim communities, uh, Muslim countries, uh, the region that um, now is evolving and changing, I think in many ways. First, uh, as uh, Special Envoy Amiri said, uh, GCC is changing in a good way. It's opening up. It's not the GCC in the Gulf countries that in the 90s, some were in line with the um, Taliban uh, uh, government at the time. But uh, today that's not the case. So I think we can tap on them uh, very much. But we must be also very cautious and smart about it because we don't have to create an, a narrative or a message to say, this is the mess, we're handing it over to you because you're the Muslim countries, you have the hands on and do with because um, uh, it's a leverage we have. And once that leverage is uh, eliminated and they're tired and then they get angry and drop it off back on us, then we won't have uh, a way around it. So I think I would say engaging with the Muslim country, but with that cautiousness, with that cultural element to be there. And I think we must also bring the security conversation. I say the same thing as Richard said. 
um, it's it's an important discussion right now that we have a cohesive voice, what's happening in Afghanistan and then in the region. I think region, uh, when we talk about the GCC, it's it's um, it's the element of the um, Islamic ties, but I think it would be immediate neighbor, um, regardless how strong of posture they have, they are afraid, they're scared uh, because Taliban are the future threat in the, in the region. Uh, we're seeing what is happening right now in Pakistan. There's a lot of fear in Central Asia. And um, we must start that conversation and say, look, uh, we have to find alternatives what may happen when Taliban are completely and continuously be in power with the radical ideologies that they are bringing. And I think there is, there is, there is one more change in the region too. It's the new hegemony. We just recently saw what happened uh, with the new agreement between Saudi and Iran and the role of China. And I think I, I don't see that conversation happening in the US here. Uh, China is our immediate neighbor in Afghanistan. And uh, what it means, their investment, their engagement in the ground, uh, are they there or not? I think we have to raise this question. We have to start finding out more details, their uh, investment in the natural resources uh, and, and, and how how they're filling the gap. I think that's that's where uh, the big question is. And I think the last, probably it's the most uh, important part is the role of the UN. Maybe it's because I worked at the UN before or I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a very strong um, advocate for multilateralism. I'm a strong believer that the United Nation, despite so much disagreement and criticism we may have, it's still an important player and especially in the case of Afghanistan. I come from the United Nation at the time when um, it was before the fall of Kabul. And, uh, and I witnessed Maria Angela together. Um, we never had a complete consensus of the member states on UN's engagement in Afghanistan, but today we do. And I say tap on it. Tap on it when this consensus does exist. It's a complete consensus that the UN must engage. And if we have still at the member states level, you know, our domestic politics are in a very interesting shape moving one way or the other, and probably not much of a political leverage to raise the tough question, how are we dealing with this scenario right now? Um, uh, I think the UN probably is in a better place. Um, the DSG had a visit to Afghanistan. She came back with uh, a uh, couple of proposals and recommendations, and I think it's extremely important for us to start to listen. The SG has the leverage, the SG has the power to um, to to um, utilize uh, what uh, he can do. And I think as the uh, Security Council, probably it might be the first time when member states, especially the P5, will not have much of a hesitation if UN takes a greater role on the long, longer and the larger question. I'm going to end here. Thank you. Well, Sorry. thank you so much, Ambassador. I thought that some of the um, subjects that you touched on are much debated today in terms of whether or not humanitarian assistance should continue. And you certainly affirmatively endorse that. Development assistance needs to, uh, to continue as well. Um, the regional uh, situation, both economic, both in terms of security and pol and the political hegemony, as you pointed out, um, and then the role of the United Nations. And I think it's interesting that our host today, um, Ambassador Zapia and uh, Ambassador Raz, were colleagues uh, at the United Nations, and uh, you really played a very forceful role with the Friends of Afghanistan and many of your uh, the missions there so we can see what, how this can continue uh, going forward under very different circumstances, clearly. Uh, Dr. Habiba Sarabi, uh, wonderful to have you with us as well. You have um, worked uh, in negotiations with the Taliban. You have lots of experience uh, in uh, government affairs uh, with them and uh, in the current situation. I wonder what your insights are in terms of what leverage uh, the international community has that that might be um, positive in terms of some uh, reaction from the Taliban, uh, but also the regional uh, situation that um, 
Ambassador Ross tackled. It'd be interesting to hear from you on that as well. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Verve, and thank you, Ambassador Zapier and uh, Georgetown Institute for Peace and Security that uh, keep Afghanistan crisis on the loop, uh, despite of all crises uh, around the world. Still, uh, we are today talking about uh, uh, Afghanistan. So, and good afternoon to everyone, and a warm salam to all my uh, friends and. Uh, uh, Afghan sister and brother. Uh, let me, Ambassador, to start from my experience Please. from uh, Doha or from negotiation. Before uh, the Doha talks start, starting, there was another uh, uh, meeting or another dialogue started on uh, June 2019. And uh, on that uh, dialogue, uh, uh, out of 35 uh, delegation from Afghanistan, 11th of us, we were women. Two of us, we are here, me and Marijan Akremi is on, on the back. So uh, we were uh, the member of, of that uh, uh, intra-Afghan call, intra-Afghan dialogue. This, uh, uh, during the intra-Afghan dialogue, which was uh, took for uh, held for two, two days, so the, uh, mostly women were engaged with Taliban during the lunch or during the extra time. Uh, and uh, so they were talking or asking about the women's rights and also uh, mostly the clothing or hijab was one of uh, us today. It's the, it was the big matter. They were asking from them and they were uh, saying that, okay, no, this is, you are completely fine. You are uh, nice. So your hijab is, is good. So women can go to education except the uh, presidential uh, uh, position and the judiciary uh, position, the all position the women can do, the, uh, can work on that. It was something that they were saying. And the same time when we had the discussion, I mean, during the talks uh, in Doha, so of course we didn't come to the agenda because uh, most of our time just is spent for this uh, terms of reference or, or the rule and procedure to the, uh, to the talks, but sometimes when, uh, of course, uh, the uh, women issue was not on the top of our separate agenda to the discussion, but any time that we were talking about this uh, uh, women's rights and the uh, hijab and, and, and clothing, they were very positive on that. They were very positive. They, were, they wanted to show the international community and the people of Afghanistan, or at least the delegation, that they have been changed. So uh, uh, I think uh, intentionally, of course, uh, some people were uh, posted or delegated for, for that team to send it to, uh, to uh, Doha to talk. Uh, the, the person that um, on that time, he was somewhere in Pakistan, still he's unknown person, but he is making decision or someone else is making decision in behind of everyone. So just they sent some people like Abbas Stanekzai or the Lawar or some others uh, that at least they can uh, they can talk with the people um, warmly or at least uh, to show uh, the face. But unfortunately, uh, the, the positive face. Unfortunately, when they uh, took the, the power by force after uh, uh, August 15, so every day they are releasing. A, a edict or a, a order or a farman that, uh, for example, today uh, around more than 90 farman or edict uh, released, but uh, more than 86 of them is against women. This is something that uh, we believe in as according to the research some people uh, did. So they are just applying the policy that they wanted to do during the uh, uh, 90s exactly the same because all their uh, edicts and, and order in Farman is, is against women. Women can go, cannot go to school, to work, to, to her mom or everything. So even for contraceptive, they are just banning that, that women are not, uh, do, don't have the rights to, to do it, uh, to take this contraceptive. So this is something that the policy didn't change. They just wanted to show that they have been changed. Actually, uh, I can very um, uh, surely say that 
uh, they wanted to cheat some of the Afghan people and the international community. They cheated us that they have been uh, changed. So this is, uh, but how, how we can bring change and uh, what will be the leverage that uh, your excellency uh, ambassador said. I think the person, the uh, uh, unknown person that is staying in Kandahar, he, he thinks that he is the representative of God. So, but I don't know, nobody knows, nobody, I mean, uh, 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 he didn't show anyone uh, his face, so nobody knows him. But anyway, 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 if he is there, he's a human being. He needs all these, uh, I mean, food, clothes, many other things. We have heard that he, ha he has some 30, uh, 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 person that uh, guarding him, so he needs all these the the uh, uh, the goods and material that we need. He is also a human being. He need how we can push them, push him or push the other follower to uh, to sanction him or the others. Uh, uh, Ambassador Ross mentioned about all the sanction and recognition. Of course, for uh, uh, for him is not a matter. But for the others, the sanction and recognition is a matter. Believe me, this is a matter. This is a matter. And uh, so we have to keep hammering the nail and uh, without frustration. This is something that we shouldn't, we, especially we Afghan, we don't have the right to frustrate for that. We have to keep pushing and pushing. So I'm, I'm sure that one day it will work. One day it will work. And also the uh, regional country, as uh, Ambassador Ross said, it will help. There's, uh, I mean, uh, Indonesia, the Gulf country, and especially we have to think and keep in mind uh, the Uzbekistan. When I was in New York, I had the contact of this ambassador there uh, in Uzbekistan. Next time when I go, I will meet him. So this is something Uzbekistan has a very uh, close relation with them, but at the same time they are contracting very big project. So this is they are uh, I mean sacrificing the, all the human rights and women's rights in Afghanistan for their own I mean threat and and benefit. So we have to talk with them, and all the policymakers should talk with the Uzbekistan that the, what's their what can be their role. And Qatar is playing a big role. And uh, uh, even for education, I have met uh, Lolo Al Khater and, and when I was in New York, and she's doing, doing a great job, and especially on the education system uh, for the certification that uh, 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 Richard, you mentioned about that. And she said that she's not publishing a lot of, uh, doing a lot of uh, noise, but uh, she's thinking about that. And I'm sure that. Uh, 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 Amiri you also talked about that. This sort of small things can help. I mean, of course, it cannot be an alternative for the, uh, all the education, but it can work. But again, I am uh, emphasizing on the recognition and normalization that for uh, Richard report, it, is, uh, it came. But the normalization is another issue that we, all the international community and the stakeholder uh, I should think about that to not normalize this situation in Afghanistan or not showing, I mean, when there is a platform for uh, for Mutaki to, uh, to, uh, to write an op-ed. So this is something that they, they want to normalize the situation. So this is another issue that we have to think about that and uh, keep putting, uh, I mean, put pressure to them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarabi, and keep pushing. That's what will leave the room, thinking about all those ways uh, that you mentioned. Uh, Dr. Loredana, I'm sorry for my voice. Um, uh, Loredana Tiardescu, it's it's really wonderful to get your perspective because you are part of uh, the NGO community in a significant way, the global NGO community. WISE has a very strong reputation, and you head up WISE. Um, in, in Italy and in your region with the Mediators Network. I wonder if there are tools and strategies that you have found effective um, that we could be using 
more effectively. In this situation, bringing the clout of civil society much more strongly um, on these challenges, particularly with respect to education. Um, and maybe you can give us some kind of a call to action on, in that regard, because I know we have many representatives from civil society here. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And since we are talking about synergies, let me first of all say thank you to the Italian Embassy, uh, to the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security uh, for being the co-host of this event, and of course to the Ambassador Zappia and to you, Ambassador Dirvin, uh, for your leadership and strong support, concrete support to women. Uh, and then also to Carmelo Barbera and Lina Tori Jean, because they really made this possible. <laughs> they worked hard for this event. Uh, so let me say, first of all, that uh, the drama this dramatic situation in Afghanistan reminds us that uh, the progress on women's rights cannot be taken for granted. Uh, it calls us to have a urgent and inclusive response to the crisis and also to action all those international frameworks that we have to protect uh, and defend women's rights, such as the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Um, so I will try to focus on what is, let's say, more relevant to our work and more uh, close to our work as wise uh, Italy. Um, and I would like precisely to uh, mention this need uh, to work in synergy uh, in order to ensure that Afghan women and Afghan women's voices are really centered in all our efforts, uh, in all the conversations, reflections, actions that we have on women's rights and uh, on the future of Afghanistan. I think that this should be really the core of our, of, of our, of our effort uh, to work in synergy. And let me bring some concrete examples in order to explain exactly what I mean. Um, first of all, we are talking today about education. Education is, of course, the premise uh, in order to allow, enable women to participate in all sectors uh, of public life. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we know that there are many women already well-trained, well-educated, uh, women who used to have uh, high-level positions uh, as diplomats, as politicians, as activists in a different Afghanistan. And we think that we should not forget those women. And we think also that we need their insights, their expertise, their uh, unique view uh, on uh, women's needs and community's needs. And most, many of them left the country uh, in 2021, uh, but still they are playing a big role because they are raising their voice uh, while so many women in Afghanistan are silenced or voiceless. And this is why in uh, almost one year and a half ago, as Wise Italy, together with the support of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we decided to uh, launch this project with Afghan women leaders, all women who used to have uh, high level positions in diplomacy, foreign policy at negotiating levels, uh, with the uh, uh, great support of Fatima Gailani, uh, former negotiator. She was really instrumental to, to bring together those women and involving in focus group discussions and in this, in this what we call task force, women such as Abiba Sarabi, uh, but also Frozan Nawabi, the focal point for the 1325 resolution, or uh, um, Mabuba Seraj, who is still in, uh, in Kabul. Uh, the idea is really to provide a sort of platform in order to exchange ideas, recommendations, uh, to continue the dialogue on the future of Afghanistan and on the role uh, the international community can play. We think that we really need to listen to those women in order to understand what we can do as international communi community and what kind of leverage we can really use because they know the context and they know uh, the needs. Um, we think that uh, uh, the recommendations we are collecting should be then taken into consideration by the different governments, by the different stakeholders, and can be really helpful for, for them, for their work. At the same time, uh, through this kind of initiative, we are trying also to change and to shape uh, a different narrative about women. Of course, women are victims of this situation, but can, they can also uh, be an agent of change, and uh, we are trying to, to stress uh, uh, this role. At the same time, we are talking here about education um, and the need to empower uh, younger women. Uh, younger women now, uh, they feel really isolated and silent, so there is a need to give them back their hope. And we are trying to do this with a mentoring program. Uh, we are launching the mentoring program right now, and uh, we are uh, launching it under the suggestion and the request, actually, of a young uh, uh, activist who is in a refugee camp uh, outside Afghanistan. Uh, she told us that they really need to 
uh, feel supported. They really need uh, a reinforced sisterhood and uh, understanding that they are not alone in, in all of this. I know it is just a small piece of, 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 a, much, of, of a much bigger picture, but we, I feel that this is also important in a sense of a sort of psychological support that is much uh, needed. Uh, then, of course, the role of diplomacy and uh, the role of the international community. I think that uh, uh, they are really playing um, uh, a crucial role in putting women's rights, women's needs at the center of all their efforts. And of course, these should be also the center of any possible engagement with de facto authorities in Afghanistan. This should be a, a sort of prior uh, condition in order to, uh, you know, to have any kind of engagement with benchmarks, uh, with uh, gender um, uh, response also in all the different policies, such as the humanitarian assistance. And then I think there is also an aspect to, to point it out, which is uh, putting women at the center means also in the long term, uh, contributing to uh, have a different, uh, to change the paradigm in foreign policy, in uh, cooperation, in humanitarian, in humanitarian assistance, in a way which is uh, gender sensitive, in a way which uh, will rebalance the power dynamics, uh, in a way which uh, uh, will uh, really uh, help us to have a more diverse and inclusive response to, to, to the current challenges. I mean, it's clear today that facing uh, the current challenges, it, it is not possible to have an approach as business as usual. We need fresh ideas, we need to think out of the box. And uh, this was stated somehow also during the last uh, CSW when uh, uh, there was this uh, request for an independent uh, uh, assessment of what the international community is doing. And if we want fresh ideas, if we want also to bring a gender expertise, I think that an important role to play um, is um, is the role of the, the, the women mediators and uh, women peace builders networks. And I'm bringing this specific example because as Wise Italy, we are the implementing partner of the Mediterranean Women Mediators Network, as you mentioned. This is an initiative, an initiative launched by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and implemented by Wise Italy and YAI. Uh, the idea is really to recognize the role women can play for the stability and the security of the Mediterranean region. Uh, and I think that these networks are really powerful. They already exist. They are collecting and putting together women who are experts who lived uh, or are still living in very difficult situations, in conflicts, uh, uh, in unstable countries. Uh, so they can really provide us a rich source of expertise, of information. They can really help us uh, uh, to have and to, to keep high um, the, the the focus on Afghanistan and on Afghan women as a collective voice. So I think that this, this can be used as a best practice, as an example, also for Afghan women uh, in terms of networking, but it can also, and it should be used more and more as a political and strategical tool uh, if we want this kind of independent assessment, if we want to bring together new, fresh ideas. Uh, and then last point is about uh, uh, collective action. Uh, as I said, we really need, uh, according to, to me and according to the women we are involving in our uh, focus group discussions, we really need to work more and more in synergy, uh, which means, first of all, linking more the policies, policies which are often conceived in silos, but we know that stability, women's rights, security, development cooperation, uh, political cooperation, they all they are all interlinked in a way, so we need to have this kind of a holistic approach. And at the same time, we need to work together, uh, bringing together the different actors and the different initiatives. I'm bringing here the example of Wise Italy, but at the same time, I'm aware and we know that there are many initiatives for Afghan women all over the world. We don't want to overlap, we don't want to duplicate initiatives, we have the same objective, uh, so we should um, um, probably have a sort of coordination, coordination, coordinating mechanism or platform in order to bring together all the ideas we are collecting in order to learn from each other and maybe uh, have a sort of division of, of tasks according to our different expertise. Uh, I mean, this, this uh, event today is going in the right direction because we have so many stakeholders and and voices around the table, but we should definitely follow up on that and, and continue, uh, continue with this joint effort. And let me conclude, uh, going back to the Afghan women, uh, let me echo what uh, other people already said. 
uh, in these years, I met so many Afghan women and I'm inspired really by their determination, their willingness, their courage. And I think that we need to uh, continue to support their work, but also uh, we need to um, um, recognize and, and value really their expertise and their often untapped agency. Uh, this is in the, rest, in, in the interest of everybody, is um, in our interest to unleash their competence, their enthusiasm, uh, their talents, uh, uh, and this is really for the peace and security of all of us. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Well, you know, Laura Donowell, you were speaking, I was thinking of my first visit to Afghanistan, meeting with a small group of women I didn't know at the time, and the first one said to me, stop looking at us as victims and look at us as the leaders that we are. And she was so right. And that has always stayed with me. And you just reinforced it again, because it is something we, we should all be called uh, to continue to keep in mind and to act on. So thank you for those uh, very concrete examples and for the call for all of us to be better coordinated and work more collaboratively uh, in the days ahead. Please thank our panel. And now I'm pleased to introduce a uh, special representative, Tom West. He is the United States Special Representative for Afghanistan, and he's the Deputy Secretary uh, for uh, Afghanistan. He um, previously served as Special Advisor to the Vice President for South Asia and the Director for Afghanistan and Pakistan at the National Security Council. He's held many senior roles at the State Department, uh, working on uh, issues with respect to Afghanistan, India, and Pakistan. Thank you so much, Tom, for joining us. Um, come on up. Uh, thank you all. Uh, first, an enormous thank you to the Embassy of Italy for convening us today. Um, there are no shortage of issues that are capturing global attention among our allies. Uh, first and foremost, of course, Ukraine, the challenge of China, climate change. Um, but we need to stay focused on Afghanistan and on half of Afghanistan's population. So thank you for your leadership in this effort. And John Franco, uh, I, I appreciate your partnership over years now. Um, why does the United States care about this matter? of women getting educated. It's not because it's simply a human rights issue. It's a fundamental matter of stability in a country at the heart of a region that is increasingly unstable. Since women were withdrawn from the economy, a country whose public expenditures were 75% donor funded, a country where 40% of the economy was aid driven, uh, lost a billion dollars in its GDP. The shutdown in the secondary education system has resulted in 500 million in economic losses. And as Rena said, this is a man-made decision. There are no religious or no legitimate cultural reasons for banning women from getting educated. In contrast, if you talk to any uh, Islamic scholar, they will say that this is an obligation within Islam. And so in the weeks after March 23rd of last year in 2022, um, you didn't see sort of a, a smattering of protests in Kabul. You saw uh, tribal elders, uh, ulema from every province of Afghanistan, including some of the most conservative parts of the country from Paktia and Paktika, from Kandahar, rise up and demand to see their daughters educated, to see their mothers return to work. And so this is an issue of domestic legitimacy for the Taliban that will not be resolved until we see women and girls back in school. I wanna spend my time just amplifying a couple of the things that my uh, fellow speakers here today said, uh, because they remind us that um, uh, governments don't have a monopoly on wisdom about what to do looking ahead in Afghanistan and, um, and neither does the United States. Uh, so first, Ms. Wahidi uh, made me feel old uh, when she talked about inventing an app. Uh, I don't know where this happens. I assume it's on a computer, but um, I'm glad she's doing her work. Um, she made an apt point. 
Afghans need more than food. They need livelihoods. Um, and so a challenge I would offer to all of you uh, is to partner first and foremost with the Alliance for Afghan Women's Economic Resilience that Secretary Blinken and Rena um, and our SCA Bureau launched uh, last year. This is about harnessing the creative power of uh, the private sector in, in putting women back to work uh, to try to plug some of the billion dollar gap that the Taliban first and foremost has created. Um, but I have to tell you, Ms. Wahidi, that there are problems that are simply incredibly difficult to, to, to fix. How do we fix a banking system uh, when banks do not wish to deal with institutions led by the Taliban? How do we uh, support job growth uh, when for governments, some of the easiest paths to go down are shut off for us right now? We're not, not gonna be stepping back to iconic infrastructure projects in Afghanistan at this stage. Um, some of the international financial institutions that are quietly re-engaging in Afghanistan in critical ways to support basic human needs, they are leading the way intellectually on this question of how we empower women through the private sector. Um, and so for all the folks uh, in the audience who are smarter on these subjects than I am, um, I would send you straight to the World Bank and straight to the Asian Development Bank um, to partner with them. And again, how we empower women by getting them back to work in the private sector in Afghanistan. I thought Special Rapporteur Bennett reminded us that we need to maintain standards as we look at this issue. Um, I am aware of the same reports of uh, stark revisions to a curriculum. It's uh, deeply concerning. Um, I don't have great answers about how we address this matter, but I do think uh, that, uh, as Rena said again at the front, um, we do need to keep the Muslim world uh, engaged on matters of curriculum development in uh, a country where those in power at the moment um, are, are claiming to be implementing a vision of Sharia. So uh, we commend Indonesia, we commend uh, Saudi Arabia, we commend Qatar, Turkey, the UAE and other Muslim majority countries for leading in this space um, because I think we would be less credible in doing so ourselves. Um, Ambassador Adela Raz uh, noted uh, that the UN plays an extraordinarily important role. And I'm reminded of this anytime we speak with the current leadership of UNAMA. We have a former Kyrgyz prime minister uh, who is SRSG, a very capable German diplomat, Markus Putzel, um, and a humanitarian country team lead uh, who's also just really solid. They have 11 field offices across the country. Um, they have exceedingly tight ties to all of the implementing organizations that we so rely on to deliver humanitarian aid. Um, I was frankly surprised and very glad to see a technical rollover for UNAMA's mandate um, just earlier this month that includes a continuing strong uh, mandate for human rights as well as monitoring um, in this uh, situation. Uh, but there may be more that UNAMA can do, that the United Nations can do in, in thinking about creative diplomacy uh, in the years ahead. I would draw everyone's attention to uh, an UNSCR uh, that passed uh, along with, uh, but separate from UNAMA's mandate, calling for an independent assessment of international efforts in Afghanistan. Um, the kind of homework that I'm trying to do right now uh, to get smart is on how the UN has organized major powers uh, to deal with extraordinarily difficult situations in Syria, Libya, Yemen, Myanmar, other contexts in which we want to see fundamentally different conduct from authorities. Uh, but many countries, including the United States, have uh, a, a lot of restrictions, rightfully so, around how far forward we can lean uh, in that engagement. Um, so uh, I think there is, is uh, more to the question of how the UN is organized uh, in the head. And again, I would, I would uh, draw folks' attention to the UNSCR that passed alongside the UNAMA mandate renewal um, for a place where some of that thinking will begin to get unpacked. The last thing I wanted to pause on was just uh, Governor Sarabi noted uh, that normalization remains uh, an important set of, of leverage. Um, and uh, just last week during budget uh, testimony, budget testimony during which uh, Secretary Blinken got a huge number of questions on Afghanistan, 
um, which I think reflects the fact that our society and our Congress still uh, care a great deal um, about Afghanistan, about Afghan women, uh, about the plight of a people that we partnered with for, for well over 20 years. Um, and he said this, the Taliban want normal relations with the international community. Until they change on this fundamental matter of allowing women to be educated and to work, it's not going to happen. Um, so uh, when you think about uh, the 135 members of the Taliban who are under uh, crippling sanctions under the 1988 regime, I'm not aware of one country that has even proposed sanctions relief for those individuals. When you think about uh, the 9 billion in suspended assets outside of Afghanistan, uh, which belong to the Afghan people, uh, 3.5 billion of which are sitting in Switzerland now in a foundation that the United States uh, and the government of Switzerland and two Afghan experts uh, helped to uh, establish. The Taliban do not have access to any of those assets. Um, when you think about uh, international financial institutions, uh, the Taliban do not have representation with any of those institutions. They do not have any diplomats accredited uh, anywhere in the West. Uh, they do not have a permanent representative sitting in New York. Um, and so on normalization, uh, we need to hold a line until we see fundamental change in conduct. Um, again, Ambassador, I wanted to thank you for your leadership of this initiative. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I've learned a lot. Uh, and thank you for all the good work you all are doing. Well, a number of cogent points for all of us. Uh, certainly investing in women's economic capacity, upholding standards, the role of the United Nations and the Security Council vote very recently, I think it was last week, that in addition to the renewal of UNAMA uh, has this new assessment uh, as part of it and uh, holding the line on normalization. Thank you very much. Uh, and now uh, to our very special uh, speaker for closing remarks, uh, the special envoy, uh, Gian Gianfranco Petruzella, uh, the Italian special envoy for Afghanistan. Uh, he will discuss with us, uh, hopefully, uh, what we've heard, his, his conclusions on what we've heard today, connecting the dots across the regions, and how can we can better uh, advocate effectively. Uh, so special envoy, please. First of all, I would like to really to thank the Georgetown Institute for uh, Women, Peace and Security for the leadership and the cooperation and the support they offer us in organizing this uh, event this afternoon. And also uh, Women in International Security Italy for their cooperation, which has been really essential for the success of this afternoon. And last but not least, the Embassy of Italy, Her Excellency Ambassador Zappia and all the staff of the embassy, because without them, we wouldn't be here today really for, for this event. Well, the issues have been discussed this afternoon are very important. Uh, many sincere thanks to the distinguished speakers of this afternoon. The level of the discussion has been excellent. And of course, the challenges are many. We are aware of that. And there are not easy solutions uh, that we can you know, envisage and implement easily. It has offered us this afternoon a lot of food for thought and is at the same time a call to action for all of us. From the presentations, we've got a sense of urgency, which arises from the perception on, of how serious and unacceptable is the wound inflicted by the Taliban with these restrictions to the body of fundamental rights and freedom of Afghan women. Uh, Thank you also to uh, Special Rapporteur Bennett, because uh, uh, in some way he drew our attention on the fact that we shouldn't accept normalization of this situation. Uh, because of course there is a tendency in the end to try to compromise, to keep channels of dialogue. 
with the Taliban. Of course, having channel of dialogue is important, but at the same time, this does not have to come at the expenses of the principles. And the principle is that human rights are fundamental, and so we cannot compromise on rights. Fighting to reverse the restrictions on, uh, on access to education is a battle for the affirmation of a principle that the majority of the international community supports, as some of the panelists stressed in their intervention, in their, uh, in their uh, speeches. Uh, on this extensive consensus, we need to build the largest possible coalition. There are also practical questions concerning what options we have at our disposal to counter the devastating effects of the restrictions. The speakers of the first panel, Mrs. Hassan, Mrs. Wahedi, Mrs. Byrne, offered several suggestions on ways to act and alternatives on, let's say, best practice that have already worked and might continue to work also in the future to preserve forms of education and schooling, even in a non-permissive -perm environment like Afghanistan today. Mrs. Hassan talked of civilian, civilian, civil society organization active on the ground and rooted in the many diverse local realities of Afghanistan. They are a point of reference to channel to us needs and concerns of girls. They have also been able very often to gain exemption at the local level. And we think we have to work on this to try to strengthen this kind of uh, you know, exemptions. Uh, these organizations have been our partner for years and are still important counterparts in our effort uh, to reach out to women and girls and provide them with alternatives for fulfilling their aspiration, aspirations to complete their education. As Ms. Wahedi explained, and also uh, Ms. Mrs. Hassan, uh, we have an ally in technology for our struggle. Physical distance does not represent anymore an obstacle to exchanges ideas or cultural content, contents. This is also true in the domain of education, where we have examples of the provision of courses from remote experience we can and we shall build on in Afghanistan because they are very, I mean, they offer really an answer to the needs Oh, uh, that the population in particular, I mean, the situation of girls requires. The call to provide alternatives if school remain closed has also mobilized civil society organization, organizations at international level. Such initiatives should be structured in a systematic network of multi-stakeholder multi partnership to overcome difficulties and challenges, as, for instance, Mrs. Byrne uh, explained. As many speakers recalled, education without access to work is meaningless. Only a participation without restriction for women to social and economic life can assure them dignity, respect of the rights and equal opportunities. The issue of access to education is a component, fundamental component on, of the wider problem of women condition and status in Afghanistan under the Taliban regime. In a few months, it will be two years since the fall of Kabul. Not just the US and Europe, but the entire international community is still looking for an effective way to engage the Taliban. In this regard, the topics discussed in the second panel are extremely relevant. How do we increase our leverage with the Taliban? How to gain a capacity to address developments in Afghanistan in line with the aspiration of the Afghan population. Ambassador Raz stated quite clearly that coordination of position and messaging among the members of the international community and within the UN is a powerful tool. 
And of course, it's also important the role that the UN, the Security Council can, can play. Uh, compared to the past, of course, the UN has to be even more at the center of all international dynamics to try to address the situation in Afghanistan. This is true if we think of the interests of the Taliban leaders have expressed in getting an international le legitimation as some of the speakers uh, was uh, reminding. But maybe it's not true of all the movement because we know that maybe the, the, the leaders in Kabul might be interested to that, but not the leadership in Kandahar. So, yeah. The region is also crucial, and uh, it has been an effort from all of us to try to reach out to the region, to talk to neighbors. Uh, some of the speakers mentioned a few of them, Uzbekistan, Pakistan, all of them relevant. But of course, again, is the UN in the right position you, to really have everyone sitting around the table and discuss in depth? the situation in, in Afghanistan. And it's also very important, as many have already mentioned, the role of the Muslim majority countries. We are aware of the constructive, constructive contribution of the, some of them, it was mentioned uh, Indonesia, was mentioned Qatar, some of the monarchs in the Gulf. But of course, I mean, given that the issue of education is seen by the Taliban through the paradigm of Islam, it's very important then that Muslim majority countries can play a role, an important role. And so far, they have been quite constructive and we appreciate this. Of course, we will continue our engagement with all these counterparts and all these actors. And we will try to have really a common uh, sense and view of how we should address and tackle all the challenges in Afghanistan. But still there is a long work to be done from our side. Then it was also mentioned, particularly by Dr. Teodorescu of Wise Italy, the importance of promoting closer connection and nas at national and international level among initiatives in support of Af Afghan women with the goal of building on the shared understanding that Afghan women deserve and urgently need to have their voices heard. The promotion of synergies and networking among different national and international platforms in support of women is another way, in addition to diplomatic channels, to mobilize support for Afghan women and maximize the pressure on the Taliban. And indeed, the pressure is mounting to the point that even in Afghanistan, in the ranks of the Taliban, there are voices in support of reopening the schools for girls. This is also the outcome of the closer co coordination among allies and partners achieved thanks to the role of the US that US has played in this regard in relying international consensus in support of Afghan women and girls. So I size also this opportunity to thank the representatives of the US administration that are with us today for the, the role of leadership the US has played in this, in this uh, very important uh, uh, issue. In conclusion, it is a year that the ban on secondary education for girls has been confirmed. And there is no indication that the restrictions will be uh, removed anytime soon. For Italy, a country at the forefront of the efforts in the support of the Afghan population in this crisis, to see that these issues is uh, that on these issues there is a wide cohesion and international consensus on the fact that we should react and we should act in order to change the state of things. And the fact also to hear that Afghan women are uh, very present, they show their bravery, they really uh, raise their voices to be heard everywhere. These are all reasons of, of hope. So thank you very much for your attention.
Well, we thank uh, the special envoy Petrozella for that summary. That brings us to the end of our program. Um, it is the end of the program, but the ongoing continuation of our work and the acceleration of our work. Uh, and before I leave this podium, I want to thank again the extraordinary leadership of Ambassador Zepia. It was her vision to bring us all together under Italy's leadership, and we were all more than happy to join her uh, in this endeavor. I also want to thank those who uh, worked to put the program together, to Councillor Carmelo Barbara and the embassy staff here, uh, to uh, Linda Tor John, Lena Torrijan, my colleague, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Loredana Tiorda Escu um, for the work of Weiss and her own leadership. Uh, so thank you all. And I think we have a final message from the embassy. Thank you very much, Ambassador Bevere, also for your kind words. The official program has now concluded and uh, Ambassador Zapia would like to invite uh, all the guests and the speakers uh, to some light refreshments uh, uh, served in Piazza Italia. Thank you very much.